All right, so it's 8.05. I'm gonna go ahead and start. Hopefully um, our other people that are registered can grab their coffee or whatever uh, pretty quick and then join us and have um, them catch up as we go. Um, so thanks guys for registering and coming to this in-service training. Um, we're gonna talk all about litter today, <laughs> um, all about uh, where it comes from, where it goes, how to get rid of it, what to do um, as far as focusing on it in your community and things like that. So I've created this um, hopefully pretty engaging um, presentation to share with you guys and bring back to your own counties. Um, so we're gonna get started. I'm gonna share my screen if I can find it. Alrighty, so today we're talking about addressing litter issues through extension programming. Um, my name is Jesse James. Uh, gonna get to some introductions here. So my name is Jesse James. Um, I'm an extension, assist an extension associate, oh, that is a mouthful, <laughs> um, here at MSU. I have only been here since last July, um, but I have learned a ton, a ton, a ton about litter and um, trash-free education and all sorts of good stuff in the past five, six months. And I'm so excited to share it with you guys. Um, I'm also the Mississippi Inland Cleanup Program Coordinator. And we're gonna get into um, more depth about that later as far as what I do and what that means. Um, but essentially I am working towards doing lots of uh, litter cleanups and trash for education in our southeastern counties here in Mississippi. Um, so looking to get the ball rolling on that and getting some of those started up this spring. Um, and then I'm going to let the other two people on this call introduce themselves. So Eric, you want to start with you? Hey, I'm Eric. Um, I've probably interacted with most of you at uh, meetings back when we can actually ha have those in the past. Um, been at MSU for um, almost six years now, but marine scientists um, do a lot of marine extension work. And hi, everybody. My name is Mandy. I've been at the Sea Rec down Biloxi for four years now, and I lead uh, the Coastal Cleanup Program. Um, I think I've met a few people before, but if uh, I've only been emailing you for four years, it's nice to put a face to a name. Excellent. Thanks, guys. Um, so obviously, Eric, Mandy, and I work really closely together on um, this trash-free education um, through our different programming and things like that. So we're kind of the go-to on this sort of thing. Um, so as far as this training goes, um, it's going to be, you know, kind of just a lot of information up front, but I'm hoping to have a lot of places to stop and kind of share what um, you have going on in your counties or if you have any questions along the way. Um, so if you do have a question, feel free to stop me as we go along. Um, so like Mandy just mentioned, so we're located at the um, Coastal Research and Extension Center. So CREC um, is located in Biloxi, Mississippi, that is on the coast in Harrison County. Um, and that houses the Coastal Conservation and Restoration Program, which Eric is in charge of as well. Um, so all of our trash-free education and cleanup programs are based out of Harrison County. Um, and later on, we're going to get into as far as like where Mandy's program's jurisdiction is, as far as mine. Um, but we're really looking to extend further inland. Um, and that's pretty much why we're here today is to talk about, you know, moving this. Um, even though we're located on the coast, we really want to engage um, our inland folk and get y'all, you know, kind of exposed to the litter free education and cleanup aspect of uh, our world down here. Um, so just some objectives and goals for today. Um, this is just kind of like a loose outline of what we're going to be going over. So we're going to be talking about um, the magnitude of litter issues, the types of litter, um, sources of litter, the impact of that, and then ways to prevent and remove that. And in talking about these things, the goals that we have for that are, of course, identifying and sustaining natural resources, uh, maintaining vibrant communities and businesses, uh, building up our youth through positive programs like 4-H and strengthening our uh, families and sustaining them through family consumer sciences. So just to start things off, we're going to talk about the magnitude of litter. 
Um, so litter, especially plastic, is one of the greatest overwhelming threats to our natural environment. Um, if you live on Earth, which all of us do, it affects you in every single way possible. Um, and that's a little overwhelming to think about sometimes, especially for me and Mandy, <laughs> um, just the magnitude of our jobs and trying to, um, you know, really convey to people and educate people just how much it affects each other um, is a little overwhelming, but we're going to try to keep it <laughs> a little bit um, manageable today and just kind of touch the surface on how big litter issues are. Um, most mismanaged litter often travels through waterways, through watersheds, rivers, oceans. In Mississippi, especially the southeast portion of our, uh, our state, has tons of those, tons of watersheds that lead out into the Mississippi Sound and ultimately the Gulf of Mexico and the ocean. Um, so we definitely are a good candidate for having mismanaged litter issues here. Um, so as far as litter, um, it has, um, Habitat impacts, so the entanglement of animals, uh, you know, is never good. It causes the ecosystem structure to change, so that introduction of trash and litter and things like that is going to change just everything about the ecosystem, the way, um, you know, our water is distributed throughout the land, the way animals migrate, the way animals reproduce. Um, oxygen and light levels get depleted in water bodies. If there's a layer of trash at the bottom, um, you know, plants aren't getting nutrients and things like that. I mean, those are just a few examples. That's just touching the surface on that. Um, as far as chemical, uh, we all know that, of course, plastic is mostly a uh, petroleum product. And um, of course, that is made up of chemicals and that gets leached into the environment um, I could use all sorts of fancy words and chemical terms, but that's basically what it breaks down to, no pun intended. Um, but through bioaccumulation, all those toxic ingredients get into the environment, and then we're either drinking that water, eating those um, byproducts out of the environment, and it's just, it's just not good, is the bottom line. Um, and then things like weather and UV radiation, so sunlight, or even mechanical exposure can speed up the chemical impacts of litter. Um, so if there's a, you know, if there's trash in the environment, there's just a pile of it, um, the weather can break it down. Sunlight's going to break down those chemicals inside the plastic bottles or plastic bags. Um, or even, you know, here on the coast, like wave impact, so that mechanical exposure can really just help break down those pieces even faster in the environment. Some biological impacts, which kind of just goes along with everything else. Of course, uh, fauna can ingest the harmful litter and that can cause in, uh, inefficient feeding, mating, or mobility. Um, one of the biggest and probably our favorite example to use is sea turtles in plastic bags. Um, sea turtles, one of their very favorite snacks are jellyfish. And when a plastic bag enters the environment, it just happens to look like a jellyfish. And those sea turtles are just not smart enough to tell the difference. Um, so they often eat these plastic bags and you see a lot of um, videos on the internet and literature and uh, you know educational tools using this example. Um, but I think it's one that we can kind of all relate to even if we're not on the coast. You know, most people know what a sea turtle is. Everyone knows what a plastic bag is. Um, and then unfortunately that's it's a real thing that's happening and that's a big biological impact. Um, so with that, the EPA estimates that plastic marine debris alone affects 267 different species on a global scale, which 267 different species on a global scale doesn't seem like a whole lot, but the impact is a ton. It's very, very big. And then the last one, as far as human impacts, of course, habitual, chemical, biological, all of those things impact humans as well. But in particular, it really impedes our, our habitat and our ecosystem services. So I use a lot of coastal references just because I'm from the coast. I live here, I work here, um, but this affects inland as well. So here, especially commercial fishing is a huge, huge um, part of our ecosystem and our economy here. Um, trash in the water definitely affects that. We actually just, uh, Last weekend, we were helping Department of Marine Resources take out derelict crab traps out of the environment. Um, so that way, the 
you know, those traps that aren't being used aren't just, you know, dead in the water sitting out there collecting fish um, inactively that are just not going to get eaten or put back into the economy. Um, so it affects fishing, transportation, definitely affects tourism. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit. Um, and just general health and safety, it's just not good to have litter out. Um, it's just not good for anybody is the point. <laughs> like I said, it's the magnitude of litter issues is overwhelming and kind of scary to think about, but just definitely wanted to touch very lightly on how bad it is. Um, but we're gonna talk about what we can do to help. So don't get too discouraged just yet. That's what, that's what we're here for is to help. All right, so how does this impact me? So I just scared you with all the, <laughs> the magnitude of litter issues and you're wondering, wow, like how does that impact me as a person? Um, why should I care? So not only does this affect everyone globally, nationally, statewide as a Mississippi University Extension agent, it also affects your local community in such a way um, that we're here as extension agents and extension employees in order to share with our communities and share with our, um, you know, just, just locals as far as what that means for them. Um, so whether you're a 4-H agent, uh, family consumer sciences, agriculture, anything of the sort, uh, it affects you even if you don't really think it does. Um, is there anyone on the call that is not a 4-H family consumer science or agriculture agent? Is there anyone else with a different kind of specialty? Just out of curiosity. I think that's the only, only specialties we have. Okay. Are there any um, like FCS agents on the call? I'm FCS. Okay. Okay. We got one. <laughs> <laughs> good. Yay. <laughs> we have a good mix of everybody then. Awesome. Okay. Um, so with these, uh, you know, these different specialties and areas that we're all um, experts in, we're going to talk about how that impacts each one of us differently um, and specially. But first we're going to talk about the natural environment. So of course, our natural environment would be the state of Mississippi. Um, Mississippi has 82 counties with an elevation of less than a thousand feet. And many of those counties are less than 500 feet. Uh, so we're a very flat state. <laughs> As you know, there's not a whole lot of hills, especially here on the coast. Um, it does get a little hilly the further you go north. Um, and it mostly consists of a human a humid subtropical climate within the Gulf Coast plains of the United States. Um, so we're definitely on that decline in that, um, in that Gulf watershed that goes out into the Gulf of Mexico. So with all of those natural water resources that we have, so we have of course the Mississippi River, we have nine other major river systems in our state um, and the Delta that all feed out eventually into the Mississippi Sound and the Gulf of Mexico. So what that means is that basically a good portion of our state is a watershed in itself. All those little rivers feed out into those bigger rivers, which eventually feed south into the biggest body of water of them all, the uh, Mississippi Sound, Gulf of Mexico. So in theory, the trash that is being um, you, you know, disposed of or it enters the environment in the uh, northern counties of Mississippi could eventually make its way down to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, Mississippi also has a large diversity of flora and fauna. Um, we have quite a few different types of landscapes in Mississippi, which makes it pretty unique. Um, oh, excuse me, as far as having forests, we have salt marshes, grasslands, and pine savannas. Um, and that offers lots of diversity for um, animals as well. Our economic activities include um, primarily in agriculture, fishing, timber, and mining, and then our secondary uh, economic activities are the production and manufacturing of goods and products, as well as tourism. And so I'm telling you all these things, uh, which we probably already know, either just by living here or working here in the state of Mississippi, um, is that we know that Mississippi is a special place. It has 
diversity in people, places, um, obviously the natural environment and it's worth protecting. It's worth thinking about how to make it better as far as what can we do to make this place better. And as far as taking litter out of the environment, um, it improves all of these things and improves our economic impact as far as uh, tourism, it affects uh, keeping the diversity of flora and fauna up and things like that. So as far as the human interaction, um, this theme can be found anywhere in the state where there's human settlement. So if there's humans, there's going to be an impact and an interaction on the environment. As we know, the Mississippi River has played an essential part of our state's history. Um, it has those millions and millions of gallons of the rich water silt that flows down into the Gulf of Mexico and the surrounding lands, um, a, you know, a lot into the Delta and down all the way through the uh, western part of the state, which creates some of the most rich and fertile soil in the world. So, of course, of course, why wouldn't we want to protect that? Why would we want to, um, you know, let pollution and let litter build up in that area and not do something about it if we had the chance? And then some other examples of, you know, um, human environment interaction besides litter and pollution in our state and in our waterways um, would also be things like uh, kudzu. Uh, kudzu's just taking over um, as far as trying to keep that erosion down. Um, and then the production of bulkheads here on the coast are a pretty big uh, human environment interaction that Eric, I'm sure could go off on a tangent about, but that's a whole different presentation. <laughs> All right, so now that we've um, you know, talked about the magnitude of litter, how that impacts you or you know, me specifically, um, and then the natural environment of where we are and why we should be protecting this area, we're gonna talk about how you can incorporate trash-free programs into your specific uh, areas of expertise. So as far as agriculture and natural resources, um, Really the best thing that you could do is of course, educate your local community on litter-free and uh, trash-free education. So that's exactly what we're doing today. You can take what you've learned today, bring it back to your community um, and let them know what you've learned. And through us, you can actually schedule community cleanup. In uh, later in this presentation, we're gonna explain how to do that. Um, and if you actually wanna start your own cleanup, how to go about doing that. But a lot of our natural resources, so here are coastal beaches, but especially up north, our state parks and our campgrounds heavily rely on nature-based tourism. Um, and we've learned that, of course, trash is a primary deterrent from these uh, tourism spots. Um, so there was a study done by NOAA that looked at four coastal U.S. communities. Um, and they estimated that by creating these trash-free programs in these uh, marine debris cleanups, they actually produced an additional 217 million tourism dollars created um, by introducing these programs and these cleanups. So they were actually able to boost their uh, tourism revenue and they were actually able to create uh, 3,700 new jobs out of it. Um, so it is proven that, you know, cleaning up and taking out these, um, you know, just these eyesores out of the environment actually really improves tourism and the economy and things like that. And it's also been inferred that property value decreases with litter issues. Of course, you're not going to want to, um, you know, build property or purchase a house if it's um, next to an area that's just overrun with litter. Um, and then, of course, microplastics can, of course, be found in our waterways and our drinking water due to this litter problem. Um, we have in the past worked um, with looking at microplastics in drinking water samples. And at one time we did have a, um, a microplastic sampling map, which was really interesting to look at. Um, we'll possibly maybe start doing that again in the future. But the best thing you can do as far as um, a and R and things like that would be to schedule community cleanup or start one yourselves and just really get your community involved um, in doing those sorts of things. 
So is there anyone on the call that is um, a specialist for a &R that you think you're missing some sort of component of trash-free education or litter awareness that you would be really interested in implementing this in your own community? Yeah, as I mentioned on the call yesterday, um, for those of y'all that were, were on it, like we do have a grant that supports um, a, pretty much most of these activities uh, that would occur over the next three years, maybe four years if we're able to uh, extend it out a little bit. So there's, there's definitely support there. In addition to the people support, there's um, supply support and advertising support and all that kind of stuff. And I want to add a quick comment as far as like an economic impact of marine debris. So I've heard this from several um, large industries down here on the coast where they've been trying to like recruit other like partner industries to come down and, uh, you know, set up shop in their industrial complex and all that stuff. There's been, uh, I've heard, like I said, I've heard this multiple times that they've had folks come down um, to do these business meetings and they the major deterrent for them was the environmental stewardship of the area on whether they would set up their shop there or not. They would ride down I-10 and see all the trash and they would be like, if, these, if the folks in this community don't take care of their own place, how do you think they would take care of our business? here so um, like I said I've heard that from multiple sources on how much litter discourages big business from coming in and creating even more jobs in addition to the tourism uh, that Jesse mentioned yeah thank you Eric I appreciate that all right so moving on from a and r but a you know, towards 4-H, um, practicing in these inland and coastal uh, trash removal programs can help 4-H um, students apply the essentials um, of what they're learning in 4-H to the environment. Um, and through our cleanup programs, we're introducing STEM topics into this program by integrating um, some of our goals and objectives into the goals and objectives of 4-H. Um, so I did a little searching around and it seems like um, across the country, well, really the continent, because in Canada too, they are already implementing a lot of STEM um, related activities and curriculum into their 4-H chapters. Um, I'm not super familiar with 4-H, um, except for like the basics, but it seems like if um, you're not doing some of these um, components or activities already, that these could be some really great um, options. These just looked really engaging and fun. So uh, the trash to treasure crafting was really interesting. So um, they were doing some trash free education and having kids basically turn uh, these trash items or these recyclable items that they were finding into a treasure. So they were basically upcycling them into something new. And then they were having contests um, as far as like the most creative, the most a wacky item that these kids could make. So I thought that was pretty interesting that they were building upon this curriculum of um, litter removal and trash free education and turning it into a really cool craft. Um, all sorts of recycling projects, uh, cast for trash, Earth Day activities, Global Patrol, uh, Nature Walk, all sorts of things that could just very easily be implemented into the things that you're probably already teaching your 4-H students. Um, we're also going to talk about this much later on in this uh, presentation, but um, we have a Google Drive that is chock full of um, activities, information, curriculum pieces that Mandy and I have kind of collected together to give to you guys. Um, so we'll talk about that much later and as far as how to go about accessing that. Um, but I put quite a few of these 4-H projects in there as well, just because I thought they were pretty interesting. Is there anyone on the call that is um, 
with 4-H that does anyone do any sort of uh, trash free education already or is interested in implementing it in their curriculum? I see Dawn put a comment here in the chat box about the president of the Federation of Women's Club. Yep, so they have a major uh, plant to recycle it pickup project. Yeah, I'm starting a kind of a, or me and a couple of other agents from North Mississippi or more Northern Mississippi are starting like a kayak canoeing 4-H curriculum. And I think me and Matt in Forest County are kind of thinking about maybe implementing some type of combining those two, doing like a kayak day and a cleanup day along Black Creek or some of these smaller, more commercialized little floating trips here in mm -hmm. Forest County, Lamar County area. Um, kind of been talking about doing something like that. Very cool. So with my program, which um, like I said, we'll get, kind of get in more into depth about exactly what I do. Um, but I'm actually hoping to start doing some kayak cleanup as well. Um, so Ross, if you're interested in possibly, um, you know, chatting after this presentation later on, um, we could get together and maybe work out something as far as setting up some sort of cleanup together and working together on that, because I think that'd be great. Um, Sounds good. Awesome. And so, yeah, we'll talk about uh, that Google Drive here at the end where I've kind of compiled some of these. Um, so this trash to treasure and some of these recycling projects, I put those in there um, and you'll be able to access those later if you want to take a look at them. Jesse, um, I work with, uh, I'm an assistant leader for my daughter's Girl Scout troop. Mm -hmm. and, um, I'm, I'm SBS, but I still do a little 4-H. Um, but we're, I thought this would be a good way to combine the two because they have a bag that they can get for a community cleanup. Oh, okay. And I'm just wondering if, if that's a possible thing to combine the two um, with Girl Scouts. Sorry, I'm, give me just a second. I'm writing down a note or else I will not remember. Uh, yeah, so I don't see why we, you know, couldn't somehow work with the Girl Scouts and do, you know, something a little more catered, or even if, um, you know, you guys want to make it catered to what they need in order to get that badge. So if they have to, you know, pick up a certain amount of trash or go to a certain place in order to get that badge, um, I think it's pretty easily, um, you know, it's pretty fluid as far as like what you can teach in that trash free education or through that cleanup in order to, you know, check that box for that badge. Mandy, have you ever worked with the Girl Scouts as far as getting badges for them? I know you've had some Girl Scout groups before or even Boy Scout groups. I've never been hands on with their like badging system, but I have signed off on like hours that they participate in cleanups. Yeah, we get a lot of troops that participate in our cleanups, but they very much uh, like leave their own and I just am there to provide any supplies or anything that they need. Yeah, and just jumping on that, I, I have um, like signed off on it, the volunteer forms like Mandy mentioned, but also some like special product projects by Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts um, to get their, you know, I, I forget what the equivalent of an Eagle Scout is in Girl Scout, but there's, we've done several Eagle Scout projects um, throughout the center. So I'm relatively familiar with the process, but refresher would be welcome. But I, I mean, I feel like if the qualifications are met to get the badge, then we can definitely make sure the documentation is there to, to help with that. Easily, for sure. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be something interesting because now I'm kind of interested in uh, learning more about that. So I'll have to take a look over at the uh, the Girl Scout website as you know as well as the Boy Scout website and just see what what necessarily they would need for those badges and see if we could just easily add something in um, to you know help cater to them as well. That's a good suggestion. Oh there we go. Um, 
And then our last one is family consumer sciences. Um, so as far as this section goes, this is probably the specialty that I know the least about. <laughs> um, so if this is your area of air expertise, I would really like to hear from you. Um, but you know, just flipping through some of the curriculum that you guys teach, I thought that Cooking Matters was a really good program that you do that trash-free education could easy, easily be implemented in. Um, do kind of like a very short um, introduction to composting. Composting is a really great way to take, um, you know, food waste and things like that and turn it into, um, you know, something else that can be used. So you're upcycling that food waste into compost, which you can use uh, for gardening or uh, landscaping and things like that. And it's just a good way to break it down back into the environment. Uh, you could also talk about uh, reducing plastic usage and waste in the kitchen. There's lots of resources on how to do that. I've got quite a few of those in those Google Drives as well. Um, but that was just really the first thing that I thought of that could really be interesting as far as, um, you know, these families and these children are already learning how to, um, you know, eat and cook and shop uh, thrifty and healthily and things like that. Why not just add an extra component of how to do that a little more environmentally friendly or economically friendly um, and things like that. So I thought it was pretty interesting. And then of course, family cleanups. Um, so the cleanups that Mandy and I run, um, of course, are specific events, but cleanups just don't have to happen at those specific events that we run. Of course, you can uh, pick up the immediate areas around your neighborhood um, and you can actually still submit data to the data system that we use. And we'll talk about that a little more in the future. Oh, thank you, Don. So Don put in the chat that uh, uh, that our hometown in Michigan does this where they have a lot of environmental messages and healthy homes program. Um, so great, that's good that, you know, those messages already happening, those programs are already there, and then this would just be, you know, a great idea just to add a couple more things in that would be good for all aspects. The environment, the person, all that good stuff. Is anyone FCS? We had one person on here, I think. Yes, me. I am, and the Cooking Matters curriculum is, you, is done mostly by the community wellness planner. Mm -hmm. There's not a whole, whole lot of the FCS agents that are trained. I am trained. I got trained in the spring of last year for Cooking Matters. And okay. so I will be able to work along with our community wellness planner in Jackson County uh, with maybe doing some of that when we do the Cooking Matters class. Yeah, very cool. But yeah, I think I just, you know, when I was looking at the website as far as, you know, all the different things that um, our FCA, FCS agents do. I just, that just jumped out to me and I was like, oh, that would be so easy to add something in. Um, and Terry, if you're interested in doing something like that, I, you can reach out to me and I'd be happy to, um, you know, talk with you about maybe what would be good as far as adding in like the plastic usage and waste in the kitchen. Um, and we have some, you know, connections as far as like Plastic Free Gulf Coast um, and some other really grateful or really good, great resources um, that might be good in helping implement that into cooking matters. So, okay, excellent. Oh, okay, sorry, Don. So, Healthy Homes is here. So, I'm looking at the chat box. Um, the kayaking claim happens in Michigan. Okay, cool. So is Healthy Homes in your county, Dawn? Or you mean here is in Mississippi? Yeah, yeah National. Actually, okay. in, um, in the, on the coast area that do Healthy Homes. Um, I know in Hancock County they do it and I, I'm sure Dawn is doing it over in Pearl River County. We don't mm -hmm. do it in Jackson. And I don't think they have a healthy home person to do it in Harrison. Gotcha. Okay. So like I said, FCS is 
is the least <laughs> is the least that I know about, but I'm I'm really happy to learn and like put all these connections together. So this really helps me a ton. I appreciate that. All right, so we've talked about the magnitude of litter, how that affects you, how that could impact you as an extension agent in your specialty. Um, but really, what is litter? Um, so you'll kind of hear us use the inner interchangeable words of litter, trash, um, things like that. But what does that necessarily break down to? So there is actually a difference. Um, so trash is like the dry paper packaging from your household. Um, or I'm sorry, it's dry paper packaging. It's not household waste. Um, so trash is like uh, any kind of paper waste or packaging, boxes, um, the cardboard that comes in packaging, things like that, um, that's easily recyclable um, or you know disposed of. Litter is typically cans, bottles, paper that um, people, so it's like the stuff that you find on the street or in public places. So it's stuff that we use daily um, and it's small enough to where it finds its way into the environment a little easier than other things. So like candy bar wrappers, uh, food, food products mostly. It's things that we should be throwing away and recycling, but you tend to find them more in the environment because we're using them more often. We're on the go a lot. Um, so litter is mostly things that you'll see people lying around or trying to throw away and it just doesn't end up quite in the receptacle properly. And then garbage is household items. And so those are a lot of like wet things like food scraps, um, any kind of like just kind of gross garbage that you're throwing away out of your household. Um, so there is a difference, but you'll kind of hear us use those words interchangeably. Um, but this little video that I have on here actually has a pretty good explanation of the difference of uh, trash. Trash versus garbage. Is there a difference? Well, my grandmother taught me that trash means plastic leaves, metal, tires, wood, etc. And garbage means food waste. I guess what we might now call compost. This linguistic distinction wasn't something I'd ever learned in school. I mean, to me, this is a trash can and this is a garbage can. But the Oxford English Dictionary records trash as originally meaning broken or torn pieces of wood, twigs, splinters, cuttings from a hedge, straw, etc. While garbage originally meant giblets of a fowl or entrails and waste parts of an animal. In fact, the earliest record of the word garbage in English is in a 15th century cookbook recipe for giblets. Taka fera garbages of chigones, as the head of the feta de livres and the gizeres, wash him cleaner and cast him in a fera cota, and so forth with beef broth and salt and saffron. So grandma was right. These days, however, many of us in the U.S. use the words garbage and trash interchangeably. And if you live in the British Isles, well, rubbish. All right, so I found that, <laughs> that little cute video just to be a, a little bit helpful. Um, so like I said, we're using those words interchangeably, but from their original um, their origin in the dictionary, the trash meaning, you know, pieces of wood, um, or today they would mean like the paper, the packaging and garbage being like the wet waste product of an animal, or today would just be like the wet household garbage that you throw away like food scraps. So I thought that was a pretty good explanation in a video. Um, so there are seven different types of trash and I say trash liberally. So like I said, just trash, litter, garbage. Um, there's actually seven different types. Um, so you have liquid solid household waste. Um, so again, that's just stuff that comes out of your house that you would typically be using um, kind of on a daily basis. Um, you have hazardous waste. So those would be things like batteries, um, chemicals, things that shouldn't end up in the environment. Um, just by themselves that need to be either recycled or disposed of in a very special way. Uh, medical or clinical waste. Um, mostly, you know, things like hypodermic needles or, um, you know, things with bodily fluids or things like that that need to be incinerated or also disposed of in a proper way. Um, we now have something called electronic waste. It's also known as e-waste and that's anything electronic um, that has computer parts or lithium ion batteries, 
Um, and that's actually a lot more than you would think. So it includes a lot of like kitchen, kitchen gadgets now, things that you wouldn't really think um, need to be disposed of in a proper way. Um, but these are actually in a completely separate category now called e-waste. Um, of course, we have our recyclables um, and that kind of varies from county to county, uh, community to community. Very particular, um, so I live in Harrison County and I live in Gulfport and we have a very weird um, recycling uh, company. So the recycling at my house does not take glass for whatever weird reason, but I know um, in Jackson County, they'll take glass, uh, but they won't take other things. So recycling really depends on your specific location with your specific uh, recycling provider and things like that. So you've got to for sure double check to make sure that they're taking um, certain materials and things like that, or you'll end up like me and recycle glass for a couple weeks and then realize it's not supposed to be recycled in your county. And uh, basically all the stuff I tried to recycle was thrown away because I was putting glass in the recycling bin. Uh, then you have compostable organic waste. Um, so composting is, you know, the turning of organic waste by food products or uh, leaf litter and things like that into a very uh, nutrient rich uh, mulch. And composting actually has a lot more to it than just throwing uh, waste into a pile. There's actually uh, kind of a really interesting science to it. You have to do it a certain way. You, there's certain things you can't put into a compost pile. Um, so it's, it's a little more in depth than you would think of just uh, putting these in a different bin. And then our last uh, categories, we have construction debris. Uh, so things like metal nails, uh, sharp objects like saw blades, things like that. So identifying ways to remove and prevent litter. So now that we know what litter is, garbage, uh, what kinds of litter do we have, what's recyclable, what's not, um, how do we remove it? How do we prevent it? So removing litter uh, would of course be proper disposal through recycling or through your uh, garbage pickup. So I would really encourage you to um, take a look at your local uh, recycling and uh, garbage pickup um, website and just see what they have to say and offer for your community. So like I said, in my particular uh, city, they're very particular about our recyclables. Um, I actually have to take all of my glass products and recycle them somewhere else in Harrison County. Um, so that's something I've had to learn, but it is different for uh, most places. So I would just encourage you to take a look at uh, their website and see what they have to say about that. Um, as far as community engagement, um, cleanups and events. So Mandy and I run those uh, cleanup programs where we uh, coordinate these programs with the community and we have a very, um, very engaging and excitable volunteer base that helps us with those events. And we also do a lot of outreach um, and education to our local communities. Um, but it would be good to have uh, more small group projects and activities, especially through our extension agents to really help drive home this removing litter um, from the environment curriculum. And then preventing litter. So of course, more education and outreach. Education really leads to action. And that's why we really preach about um, getting out there and doing trash-free education and really letting the uh, community know, you know, what's going on, how does it impact them? Um, how do you properly recycle in your community? Because uh, we've learned it is different. And then ultimately stopping litter at its source, which kind of seems like a daunting task um, because how do we do that, um, you know, with the power that we have? But that's all about reducing trash at a, um, a consumer level. So every time we go to the grocery store, um, you know, we could be teaching the community to make better choices, not necessarily different choices, but what's the best, um, the best choice um, to optimize preventing litter with what they have. So really teaching, um, you know, that you don't have to buy necessarily special things or expensive things in order to help prevent litter from uh, entering the environment, but you could just actually make a better choice out of uh, what you have. Um, so those are some ways of removing and preventing litter. And I think, oh, 
no, okay, we got one more slide, <laughs> then we'll take a break. Um, so how to get involved with preventing um, and removing these litter sources. So through uh, the Coastal Conservation and Restoration Program, you have the Coastal Cleanup Program, uh, which Mandy runs, and she's going to talk about at length here in a couple minutes. Um, I run the Inland Cleanup Program, and I'm definitely going to talk about that in the next couple minutes. Um, but we also have the Derelict Tra Trap Reward Program. We talked about that um, earlier. So last weekend, we participated in the excuse me, the derelict trap removal program through the Department of Marine Resources. And the derelict trap reward program um, gets together the community here on the coast and works directly with uh, fishermen in order to um, receive reward for any of these derelict traps that they're bringing back in. So what we've done is we've explained to them, you know, how necessarily this marine debris is bad, this litter is entering the environment, it's entering their world, how does it impact them and how can they do something to um, work towards fixing it, right? So the derelict uh, trap of war program is really interesting that we've been able to take this, um, this group of fishermen that might not necessarily um, care or understand why, you know, why litter in the, uh, in, in the environment is bad or whatnot but be able to show them that it does directly affect them. And then we have other uh, litter prevention and removal um, resources available at nolittermovement.com. Uh, so we've recently launched that with some local, uh, local outlets in order to get this litter removal and prevention movement started. And we're hoping to update that as we go as far as um, who can help you guys, who can help us, um, if you're interested in doing something in particular as far as um, a cleanup or trap removal or, um, oh, I'm trying to think of who else is on there. Keep Mississippi Beautiful, things like that. We have this website where all of that is in one place and you can go and find what you need to find in a very simple, easy to navigate website. Wow, so Don's saying that there's no recycling in Pearl River County. Trash pickup is by local vendors, so most people don't want to pay these people or they aren't going to pick up. Wow, okay. That's interesting. Hmm. Cool. All right, so I think the next slide. We're gonna take a break because I know it's early and our coffee hasn't really quite kicked in yet. Um, so we can take, I don't know, let's say five minutes or so, refresh, get up, walk around for a few minutes, come back. And then we're gonna um, dive into the specific programs that me and Mandy run um, and what that means for the community as far as setting up those cleanups. Um, or if you're interested in um, you know, working with us to set up one in your community. Um, so let's take about five minutes or so, and we'll come back at 8.58 and restart.
All right, so it's 8.58. Hope you had a good five minute break. <laughs> Refilled your coffee, got up, walked around for a minute or two. Um, so the next thing that we're gonna jump into is about the coastal cleanup program. So I'm gonna pull, actually, let's see. You want me to pull up on my end or you just want to advance the slides for me? Yeah, I was looking, I was trying to make you the host, but I don't think I can, but I'll just advance the slides for you. So okay, I'll let you we'll work from there. <laughs> so Mandy's going to jump in and um, talk more about her program. So take it away, Mandy. Take it away. Can you share your yep. screen? Oh, I, yes, I, can. About. I was just wondering where everybody went. Sorry, I got ahead of myself. There we go. During our five minute break, my little dog decided to squeeze up behind me. So I have like this much chair space. So if I exit the screen, it's because I was officially booted <laughs> off the chair. Um, but hi everybody, good morning. Um, my name's Mandy. I run the Mississippi Coastal Cleanup Program. Um, I have for the past four years after Eric took it over um, uh, five years ago, I believe he's actually had it. Um, so we started off pretty small um, at as a team, it was kind of me and Eric at first, uh, back in 2016. And the Coastal Cleanup program was also fairly small. So the Coastal Cleanup uh, event has actually been around for roughly 30, a little over 30 years. Uh, but MSU has only had it for the past four years or five years. Uh, and so it started off as one annual event that brought in multiple volunteers. Um, and then we've expanded it because we started to have uh, the manpower, the knowledge, and the resources to expand this into an edu like a formal education and extension program. So uh, based off this slide, you can really see that kick off in about 2018. That was whenever I was kind of uh, getting my training wheels taken off with the whole event program coordinating and uh, just marine debris education and research. Um, so in 2018, we went from having one annual event in 2017 to 11 different events. And so this included our annual event and other specialized events just throughout the year. We brought in all kinds of uh, volunteers, lots of hours, lots of trash removed. I think in 2018, it was almost 12 tons of trash uh, removed from our environment. And the Mississippi coast is very small. It's only three counties. And so if you were just kind of broaden that into Jesse's range of where she'll be for her program, that's what, 21 counties, Jesse, I believe, including the three down the coast. So the amount of impact that she's gonna have with this program is gonna be insane because I feel like in my three little counties, we've hit quite a lot. So I can just imagine what she'll do with uh, 21 or, or 18 of them because the three will still kind of be with the coastal side of things. But, and then uh, 2019, pre-COVID, we had one of our most successful years with 20 events that was, uh, cleanups. Um, we also do outreach outside of our events. So whenever we're not out in the environment, actively picking up trash and engaging with volunteers, we're taking what we learn in the research that we do and we're bringing it into classrooms. We're bringing it to teacher workshops to find ways that people can integrate this into their daily lives. And so if you want to go ahead and uh, advance the slide, Jesse. Thank you. So we had to adjust like we all did with uh, COVID. Um, so 2020 was quite a learning curve. Um, I realized that I am very volunteer power driven. If I'm not with my volunteers actively out there cleaning and educating, I feel kind of useless. <laughs> I, I'm not very good at Zooming and virtual. I try to keep my volunteers and my audience off the screen as much as possible. I find my job to be on the screen and take the knowledge that I'm acquiring and taking it to them outside where they can put all of this into action. So 2020 was a curve for me, but we did some pretty awesome things. We started off uh, pre-COVID with um, the cleanup crew, which was the first of its kind. Um, we had a volunteer powered flow in the Biloxi Mardi Gras parade that followed the parade. And as we followed the parade, we picked up trash and uh, we also, uh, talk to the people who were attending the parade and ask them, hey, that trash at your feet, can you pick it up and put it in my bucket? Just to kind of show people that you can have Mardi Gras and be crazy fun and also try to keep things crazy clean because down here, 
I'm not from the South, so I didn't realize the magnitude of love people have for Mardi Gras, but it is, it is an entire season down here. It has started and it is going to keep going for a few more weeks. Um, and it unfortunately leaves behind destruction. There's trash everywhere and the trash stays around. Um, any of the Mardi Gras beads, trash, moon pies that are left out after these parades that happen weeks and weeks, that all gets washed down um, from rain, wind um, into our Mississippi Sound. And we have um, an island right off the uh, peninsula of Biloxi called Deer Island, where all of that trash, all that Mardi Gras trash and beach just accumulates and it just stays there. And so whenever we're out there doing cleanups throughout the year, we'll find Mardi Gras beads still out there. Like we just had a cleanup, what, two weekends ago? And there were all kinds of Mardi Gras beads that are being found still um, along the coast. So that was pre-COVID. It was like a nice little shebang before COVID hit. Um, and then whenever COVID hit, we had to switch things up. So uh, the cleanup uh, program wasn't really allowed to host any events for the safety of our volunteers, but we still have volunteers who were eager to get outside. They were quarantined with their families. They needed nature. Um, and so we decided to do a request to bin initiative, which was actually super successful. And it just shows that you don't need hosted events by your program um, to have active engagement with volunteers. These volunteers would request a bin of supplies. Um, if they didn't know how to do a cleanup, talk with me one-on-one. -on -one. Um, we would either Zoom or we would email and I would explain to them how they kind of would do a cleanup. Uh, they would collect data for us so we would know what they're picking up um, and they would come pick up their supplies, go do their cleanup and then turn everything in. It was sweet and simple, fun and done. It, it was great. And then um, since this was such a success, our annual event in October that tends to bring out thousands of volunteers for one day of cleanup, um, we had to do the same thing. We had to have everybody um, request bins. So thousands or hundreds of volunteers, usually thousands, but COVID, um, were requesting bins to go out for the whole month of October um, to do cleanups. And so it's really nice with a program like this because you get such a strong relationship with these volunteers and they become, um, regulars like you'll see the same faces and the same names reaching out um, to get their cleanups going so uh, in 2020 we had over a thousand volunteers remove almost 30,000 pounds of trash uh, throughout our beaches and waterways um, during COVID so that was that was awesome next slide and this is a typical site map for our annual coastal cleanup. Um, like I said, our annual in October, it's one day uh, out of the month usually and we'll have nearly 30 sites. Um, with site captains that are just like kind of leaders to let the volunteers know how to successfully um, do a cleanup. And this is just kind of our range on the coast. So we go all the way from the west end of the Mississippi counties and Hancock County, all the way east, um, as far as we can go um, into Jackson County. So we have a broad reach, um, which is super awesome. Go ahead and advance the slide. Thank you. And uh, how is this possible? So the Mississippi Coastal Cleanup Program, we take donations and that is it. That is how we are funded. Um, and then it's possible because of our volunteers. The, pro the program would not be possible without our volunteers. I could talk about trash all day. It's not the sexiest topic to talk about, but I can do it. But the volunteers, like they are the power. They take the little nuggets of wisdom we give them and they take to their homes, they take it to their community and it spreads like wildfire. So that's something that I feel like if you get anything out of this training today, it's just little wisdom nuggets. So you're gonna, if you know that broccoli makes your lunch more healthy, you're more prone to putting broccoli with your lunch. If you know camouflage is gonna make your hunting trip more successful, you're gonna put on camouflage. If you know less plastic in your everyday is better for the environment, it's gonna be in the back of your head and you're gonna incorporate less plastic. That's overall my goal with my volunteers and the outreach and the education that we do. Um, and like I said, they just wouldn't make the success of this program possible. And our biggest sponsor is Chevron. So they support us um, with all the crazy ideas that I have whenever it comes to this program. And then we have all kinds of other uh, partners and uh, sponsors who help the program be possible. Next slide. And so, like I kind of mentioned earlier, my job is to be behind the screen. My job is to coordinate these events to get the volunteers out there. And one of my favorite parts of my job is to communicate this science, this jargon that um, the average uh, community member, somebody who just isn't very 
exposed to the science community that they can digest. And I do this through visuals because um, I'm kind of a visual learner. So uh, any of the data, any of the impact that we have, I'll turn it into infographics um, for almost all of our events. And um, kind of like a end all summary take home message. If you participated in these cleanups, if you're out there um, just kind of doing your diligence whenever it comes to removing litter from the environment, this is the impact you're making. And this is kind of what I want my volunteers to take home. And like I said, I, I can't see what they do outside of my events, but whenever they see stuff like this, I know, I know it opens their eyes for sure. Like once you see trash out there, you can't unsee it and you're bound to make a difference for sure. Next slide. And so lastly, um, the another one of the fair parts of this program is the education and outreach. So my entire job is to talk about marine debris and litter and prevention. Um, and I, I understand that a lot of people on this call, that's not their main goal with their position. Um, but it's just, it's crazy what just like a little wisdom nugget can do for one kid who can take it to their family and it can just spread. So whenever we do education and outreach, we do a lot of a uh, hands-on training um, to get the public engaged. Uh, that's students, teachers, educators, uh, project leaders, program leaders um, on how to collect their own data and analyze their data so they can make um, this impact. Uh, we do attend a lot of festivals and career fairs um, to spread awareness and uh, just spread the up-to-date research because not a lot of people want to sit behind a computer or sit at the desk and read the scientific publications that come out of this that kind of fuel um, programs like these. So that's what we like to do. Um, and then we have an awesome team of educators now, Jesse included, Eric included, and we provide in-class um, presentations and activities for students of all ages, all grade levels, um, in efforts to teach them about these issues so that they can go out and contribute to the prevention and the awareness. And then uh, lastly, we just overall teach students how to be the best environmental stewards that they can be because that's what Mississippi and that's what our counties and our cities and our homes honestly need. Next slide. Is that it? That's me. And then yeah. <laughs> um, I hope I didn't overly fan my welcome. <laughs> no, that was excellent. Thank you, Mandy. Mm -hmm. uh, you obviously explain your program a lot better than I could. So. Yeah, and if anybody has any questions, um, I know nobody else is really this close to the coast, but if you have family, if you like to take trips down here, you know who to contact if you want to get out and about about picking up trash down here. We, I'm not sure if they're on the call. We did have a couple um, agents from Jackson County uh, register. Anyone from Jackson County? If they're not here, I can bug them later. They're close. I know they're here. <laughs> they registered at least. Um, you got a Harrison County guy on there. Or, or Hancock, Harrison Hancock. Yeah, Tim from Harrison and then Terry's from Jackson. Yep. Okay. I knew we had some somewhat close people on here. They're here. <laughs> um. So thank you, Mandy. I appreciate that. So kind of piggybacking off of Mandy's program um, and kind of what Eric explained a little bit earlier as far as our grant for the Inland Cleanup program um, is that there's this huge success with coastal cleanup. And I say that because before I worked at M uh, MSU, um, I was actually a volunteer for coastal cleanup program. Um, I've known Mandy for quite a few years now, but being a part of the program and then being uh, parallel in working with the program is very interesting to be kind of on the inside from both the volunteer standpoint and from a coordinator standpoint. Um, and Mandy does a very, very good job with doing both. Um, but Coastal Cleanup here is a, it's, it's a household name. You can say Coastal Cleanup and people know exactly what program you're talking about. They know exactly uh, where the events are when they happen every year. Um, so this program has really grown exponentially in the three coastal counties um, so much that we thought we needed to expand north. So that's where I come in. So um, being the coordinator for the Mississippi Inland Cleanup Program, I'm trying to encompass the success that Mandy has, um, you know, gathered from the volunteers and coordinating the events on the coastal three counties 
and heading north into the southeastern region of these 21 counties. Um, so I'm sure you've seen this extension map before, but all of these counties in yellow or gold is technically my jurisdiction for the inland cleanup. Um, so my goal uh, with this uh, grant in my position is to have a cleanup in every county. Um, so far I've gotten uh, five. Yeah, so I'm up to five, um, including the coastal three. Um, you know, helping Mandy do her coastal cleanups and all, but I've done a cleanup in Pearl River County. Um, last year, we helped Pearl River keepers with uh, the Pearl River clean sweep. That was really interesting um, and really fun and engaging and a really cool project to help them do. Um, and then I'm about to do quite a few cleanups with um, some USM students in Forest County um, and then hopefully expand from there. So like I said, I just started in July. Um, I'm slowly building up my program um, to be this big encompassing um, cleanup uh, trash free education program for our uh, region. So I'm hoping to get to be a household name a little, <laughs> a little further north. Um, do, do, do. Wow, let's work. There we go. Um, so some goals that I have for my program in particular, like I said, really piggy, piggyback off of Mandy's program but it's just to increase the awareness of both local and global litter issues by connecting the public. Um, so the whole point is getting a volunteer, uh, a volunteer base of local people in the community in order to help with these cleanups and help clean their community because they know it impacts them. They know that it affects them directly and they know that they can directly affect it by helping pick it up um, or educate others or bringing it to other communities and telling them about it. So with that, I'm um, hoping to implement some educational presentations uh, to advance community environmental literacy. So like Mandy said, uh, not a lot of average people want to read scientific journal articles. Um, some days I don't even want to read the scientific journal articles. They're sometimes a little too long, but that's a part of my job um, in being a science communicator and being able to use my educational and professional background to read those and basically um, translate them into an easier, more palatable um, way of being able to um, put those out into the community and be able to tell people, hey, scientists know, we know that litter is bad. This is why, this is what we can do and be able to share that with people. So I think that's incredibly important to be able to communicate the science that we know to be true and to be able to understand and read and let everyone know um, and let it be available for everyone to know. And then of course, uh, with all of this litter pickup and trash free education, uh, we want the data from it through citizen science. So we know trash is bad. We're taking it out of the environment. So what do we do with that trash? And uh, what do we do with that data? Um, why does Mandy know specifically that we're taking out 14,000 cigarette butts out of the uh, sand in the beach? Um, and we're gonna talk about that in a little bit, but Collecting that data helps drive um, awareness. It helps educate, it helps our funding, um, and it just helps really push our cleanups along. Um, so this is just pretty much the overview of um, my program. So extending the coastal efforts by removing uh, moving debris from the inland community through events. So both land and water based um, so I am really interested in doing some um, kayak cleanups or canoes or um, paddle boards or anything of, uh, anything of the like that would be water-based um, because we talked about the natural environment of Mississippi and how a lot of it is focused and based around waterways. Um, and we also talked about how waterways are a direct point of entry for litter into the environment. So I think it's important that we really focus on those as well as um, land-based event um, places as well. So with my particular grant, I have to clean, uh, I have to do one cleanup per quarter. And like I said, I'm looking to do one in each of those 21 counties. I've reached five um, in the past six months um, and I'm working on more. So this upcoming spring, I just talked to some folks. I think I'm working on like six or seven cleanup events right now. 
um, that are mostly around the Hattiesburg area, but I'm definitely looking to expand. So if you've listened to us talk, uh, you know, during this training, and you're like, wow, I really think my community in particular could use a cleanup, please, please email me. Um, Cause I'm looking to <laughs> go everywhere and anywhere. Um, and it would just be helpful for your community. It would be helpful for me. Um, so it would just be beneficial all the way around. Um, so doing that trash free education and outreach, um, compiling educational tools and curriculum. Um, so I talked about that Google Drive that we'll kind of dive deeper uh, into later. But I, just being in the nature of my job, I come across a lot of different um, activities and websites and uh, social media accounts that I just think are interesting or fun to follow or have a really good uh, wisdom nuggets, as Mandy would say. So they give really good advice on a lot of things. And I want to share that with you guys. So I've compiled, or Mandy and I really have compiled kind of this master um, this master list of just all of these things we find. So we want to be able to share that with you guys as well. Um, so just a clean up location initiative. Um, so as far as getting in contact with me about um, places that you see that are just trashy or if you know of a place that could really use a cleanup, I have a Google form that's going to be here in the next couple slides that you can access and you can tell me all about it. You can even give me the coordinates to it if you want. We'll go find it and schedule a cleanup or some sort of program around it. And then eventually with that information, we're going to construct an interactive map that really shows and addresses the trash issues in our, in our state. So it'll show um, you know, where people, you know, really think that this area should be cleaned up, where have we cleaned up, how much trash have we taken out of that particular uh, spot. So that's gonna be pretty interesting once we get enough data to make that map. And then the other thing I'm kind of currently working on in the meantime of all of this is we came up with this adopt a campground sub program. So Mandy has something similar called adopt a beach, um, but adopt a campground would allow uh, local, local community clubs or chapters, Girl Scout troops, or even individuals adopt public land that they can keep tidy. Um, so this is obviously in the works. It's not uh, published or anything quite yet, but there's going to be an application process um, and an evaluation process to make sure that these people um, basically hold up to the standard of keeping this area clean that they've adopted. Um, and that's going to be pretty interesting to work with some local campgrounds and uh, Keep Mississippi Beautiful is working with us on that as far as getting signage and stuff. So it's going to be pretty cool to work with in the future. Okay, there we go. So our suggest a cleanup location um, Google form. If you take your phone out and you open the camera, you can hold the camera up to this little QR code in the bottom right corner. And if you scan it, it's going to send you to the link of the Google form and you can fill it out. So it has, um, you know, just some basic information as far as your name, where this location is, what kind of trash is at that location. So we talked about the different types of litter as far as household garbage, e-waste, medical waste, things like that. Um, and it just lets me know that you know of a place that could use a cleanup and I could keep it in mind as far as uh, working my cleanup events around that area. <clears throat> and after this uh, training, I'll send out an email with this specific suggested cleanup website in it as well. But you can scan it, it will take you there. And then just a little bit more about our adopt a campground sub program, because um, I'm really hoping to get this up and running here soon. Um, so Keep Mississippi Beautiful is partnered with us in doing this. So together we would really be making sure that um, we're recruiting volunteers and adoptees to uh, keep our state parks um, and public land clean. Um, we talked about how the natural environment really affects tourism. It affects, um, you know, all of these beautiful areas that Mississippi has to offer. Why not make sure that um, we're keeping them clean so we can continue to have an economic impact, have an environmental impact on these areas 
that people want to camp at, people want to stop and, you know, admire the beauty of Mississippi that's mostly overlooked by quite a few people. Um, and to be able to do these things with a good educational background to it. Um, so I have an application started. Like I said, it's not published yet, but if you scan this code, it'll bring you to the uh, landing page of Adopt a Campground where it kind of explains it a little more in detail. Um, so I can send this out as well later on, or if you just go through uh, nolittermovement.com, you can make your way through my website and you'll eventually uh, come to the Adopt a Campground landing page and eventually the application if you're interested in adopting a, a campground. All right, so let's take, let's take another five minute break and then we'll drive home all of the um, demos and the, um, the data collection that we have to go through and things like that because that's just kind of heavy in numbers. So we can take another five minute break. We'll come back at, we'll come back at 930. We'll make it six minutes.
all right so it's it's 9 30 almost at 8 30 so 9 30 get started back up All right, so we've <laughs> just to recap, we've talked all about litter, where it comes from, why it's bad, um, yada, yada, all that good stuff. We've talked about our individual programs as cleanup coordinators and what that means. Um, and now we're gonna demonstrate um, some of the ways that we go about collecting our data um, for our cleanups and some prevention demos. Um, so Mandy and I talked, um, kind of at length about creating some videos to publish on litter awareness and how to volunteer and collect data. Um, just because it, it kind of becomes this daunting task to um, really explain how to volunteer and collect data, even though that's our job. Um, and even though it seems like common sense, it would just be great to have these videos to be able to explain a little bit better and a little bit more standardized as to how to volunteer collect data and on litter awareness. Um, you know, not everyone can attend these types of trainings. Uh, this one in particular was, um, you know, strictly for our extension agents. I would love to do this for the public. Um, but even then, sometimes it's, you know, it's just not obtainable to be able to, uh, you know, to attend a two hour meeting, but to watch a two minute video would be great to be able to just put out into the community and be able to say, hey, watch this, learn everything you can out of this two minute video and go from there. Um, so we're working on um, making these really cool published whiteboard videos, which kind of looks similar to that trash versus garbage video in the beginning. Um, so we're gonna be making those and whenever those come out, we'll make sure that those get distributed to you guys in that Google Drive if you're interested in um, sharing those as well. Uh, but what we have today to talk about are our Ocean Conservancy data cards and the app. Um, so Mandy uses this at length with her, um, her volunteers for her uh, cleanup projects. So I'm going to talk a little bit about it. Mandy, if you have anything to add in, because you use these quite a bit more than me, um, feel free to jump in. But we're going to talk about the physical data card, what it means, uh, where that data goes, how to access that data, what we do with the data. Um, and then as well as if you're interested in, um, you know, working with me to get an event started in your county, what we're really working towards is um, getting them started, getting the community engaged, but they're actually really easy to do yourself. Like once you kind of get it um, set up in this template of volunteers and in your area, you know, just getting the location and the time really pinned down. Um, we're able to, you know, give you some of these physical data cards or access to the app if you want to do them yourselves in your own community. So we're happy to walk you through that process and show you exactly what we do and explain a little bit further as to how we use it in order to get there. Um, so this is what the physical data card looks like. Mandy has um, gotten them catered to the coastal cleanup. So it has her branding on top, which is really cool. Um, and it kind of connects the volunteers to her event specifically. Um, so I plan to also use this data collection format. Um, so even though it's the Ocean Conservancy, that's the overarching um, organization that uses these data forms and produces these data forms. Um, it doesn't have to be coastal, it can be inland. Um, so I plan on using the same um, data collection service just to make it easier between the two of us. And it's actually really, it's a really great service. And the Ocean Conservancy is an excellent, excellent um, organization. So the physical data cards are a, it's a cardstock double-sided piece of paper. Um, it's got site information where you can put the site name, the county, and how many volunteers are in your group. And then the easiest thing is that these volunteers just tally, they tick off what they're finding when they pick up things. Um, so it's got a section for the most likely to find. Those are the top 10, it looks like top 10 things that you're typically finding 
in the environment, but then there's spaces for other things as well. Uh, fishing gear, um, other sorts of trash, things like appliances, balloons, construction materials, um, personal hygiene items, packaging, things of the sort. And then it also has a place for tiny trash. So uh, things that are less than 2.5 centimeters and it's got a little scale there at the bottom. Um, so with these data cards, we, when a volunteer shows up to a cleanup, you know, they're given the supplies, they're given gloves and trash grabbers and buckets and trash bags and things like that. Um, they're also given this data card and we ask them to just tally up all the things they find. Um, and then these data cards get turned into the coordinator. Mandy does her mathematical magic on them and then turns them into these beautiful infographics. Um, but all of this data goes into um, an overarching data collection system called TIDES. And TIDES kind of keeps track of all these numbers and those numbers go to the Ocean Conservancy program and they use that for their own sort of awareness campaigns and research and things like that. Um, so it's pretty cool that it's helping on a, a local scale as far as what are you finding in this space, in this moment in real time to being able to turn it into an infographic um, that really displays what everyone found in that place, in that time, in that space, and then globally, what Ocean Conservancy is finding. What are all of these people finding? Um, so it's pretty cool to be a part of something on a small scale that also feeds into a much larger scale. Um, Mandy, do you have anything to add about these physical data cards? No, not really. Um, I do want to mention, though, like if you were to um, go to the Tides uh, website, which I don't remember the URL off the top of my head, but if you're interested in like looking at this data and checking out what Jesse's talking about, about this uh, larger um, uh, kind of take home message, it, it's really interesting. Like you'll see a lot of it's very uh, coastal or in, in the United States, coastal or Great Lakes focused. But this is open for anybody anywhere throughout the nation. Um, it, it's kind of a bridge we're trying to gap with Jesse's program of, of getting more inland areas um, acquainted um, with this kind of research and outreach. Because like Jesse mentioned earlier, litter and trash effect, uh, affects everybody um, everywhere. So that's the only thing I, I would mention. Because that's what I turn these uh, hard copy data cards into. I put it um, into the intranet where everybody can see it. And um, then I hoard them forever in my own office. Yeah, and um, just follow up on that. Jesse and Mandy, y'all plan to talk about the microplastic program too? Um, I wasn't going to, but I can pull it up really quick. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll do a, a quick rundown on it because it's like a, I don't know, it's a thing that seems to like, hook a lot of people when it comes to trash issues um, is through microplastics and a really easy activity to do with any school um, because all you got to do is collect water, filter it down, and count the number of plastics you find on the water. And don't worry, you'll find them everywhere. They're, they're in bottled water, it's in tap water, it's in ocean water, actually more in bottled water than tap water than ocean water. So, um, that's a really good activity. Um, there's a whole lot of things you can do around that as far as educational um, components, like you can tie it into like physics lessons. You can tie it obviously into environmental science. You can tie it into chemistry um, lessons and just general anything if you're worried about the uh, um, environment. That, that's just another like leverage program that we have that's Gulf wide. I see Jesse put a link to kind of our website um for that work there and there's resources at the bottom of it as well and you can see we've got data there throughout it's just a giant citizen science program that has a lot of educational components to it um, but very much litter related yeah so i actually really need to link this into our no litter movement website as well i didn't actually think about this but that would be a good thing to add um, not only to the No Litter Movement website, but also into that uh, Google Drive that I keep talking about. But I have it pulled out. So I put the link in the chat, but this is what Eric's talking about um, as far as uh, the microplastic sampling. Um, 
and it's got some examples of what we're finding. And he's right, <laughs> basically any sample you take, you're gonna find something. Um, I actually filtered, um, I filtered some water for some students in Maine the other day. And I've done sampling before, like I knew there was gonna be microplastics in there, but I, I still found some that it was just surprising to me for some reason that I still found them. Um, and it, it's very interesting to do, and it's a very, um, it's a very engaging way to get, you know, the community and especially kids involved with um, seeing firsthand microplastics that affect them. Because you know, here on the coast, um, we see a lot of microplastics just by being at the beach. Um, that's just kind of a very common thing to, you know, find the nurdles or just little chunks of plastic and things like that. And that's kind of beaten to our heads living here on the coast, but being inland, you just don't really think about microplastics on that scale as much. Um, but by filtering the, you know, drinking water, bottled water, it is interesting to see those microplastics um, in a non-coastal setting that's kind of interesting, but also a little disturbing at the same time that kind of hits that, uh, <laughs> that litter movement home for sure. I want to add uh, a, a very disturbing a little fact up. If you haven't heard, there was an estimation done a couple years ago that we ingest a credit card size weight amount of plastic um, as humans. I don't know if, I think that might be a yearly, it's not daily, it's um, but like a yearly yeah. estimation. And most of that plastic comes from our food packaging. Mm -hmm. uh, like down here on the coast, we talk a lot about how the microplastics are ingested by the fish and the seafood that we eat. So we're actually a lot more the plastic that we're ingesting as humans is coming from our food packaging, which is heavily, heavily dependent on uh, plastic. So whenever I like to traumatize people and have them make change, I'd send them scary facts like that and have them go off with it. <laughs> yeah, it does. The, you know, the, the microplastic part, I don't know why. So I guess because it's new and you don't think about it, um, really seems to get people hooked, uh, for lack of a better term there. I mean. Back when we did a lot of events, we would take, um, mostly Mandy would take microscopes that we have in the lab out to like these public festivals and stuff like that. Kids would go through and we had pre-filtered samples in there from different locations. They would look at it and see all the different plastics and they were just in shock. The adults too were in shock, but yeah, just giving you a rough idea, marine ocean water that we've collected all the way, like super offshore, all the way inland, um, has about eight pieces of plastic per liter in it. Um, tap water ranges a good bit, but I would say it averages around um, 15, 16, but bottled water that we did a study of across like 10 different brands of bottled water and it had um, like an average of like 60 pieces per liter in it. So that's a lot, because there's a lot of liters in the ocean. Yeah, like, so like I said, interesting, but disturbing. And I, and I kind of want to uh, preface um, just us working in litter removal and trash-free education, just kind of in general, because this gets misconstrued quite a bit. Um, and Mandy and I have really talked in length about this, is that we're not, we're not anti-plastic. We're not going to shame you for using plastic straws or things like that, because they do serve a purpose. Uh, to some people in particular and some communities in particular. Um, but we definitely want to use less, um, use less or different alternatives. Um, but you know, our drive, our drive home message is really a change. Um, so just wanted to put that out there because sometimes that gets a little confusing <laughs> as far as um, are we going to come slap a straw out of your hand for using a plastic straw? No. no but are we going to tell you about all the microplastics in your straw? Yes. <laughs> so. Um, so I have tides pulled up. Oh, let me share. So I have tides pulled up. I wanted to show y'all that real quick. Um, just because it's interesting to see. So this is the um, Ocean Conservancy tides. So TIDE stands for Trash Information and Data for Education and Solutions. Um, so when Mandy and I do events, um, this is where all the data goes. And like we said, it's not just coastal, it's inland, it's not just the United States, it's global. 
And it's pretty, um, it's pretty grounding to see how much trash people were picking up in particular areas. But it's also just like a really cool graphic you can look at as far as um, just being interested in where this trash is being picked up. So just to show you, you can uh, zoom in pretty far. Um, so zooming in the Mississippi, all of these little numbers down at the bottom um, are more than likely probably coastal cleanup participants. I looked at quite a few of these um, the other day. Oh, it's very close. Um, but if you click on their data point, it tells you about um, what they picked up. And Mandy and I have logins where we can go in and actually see like the individual pieces of trash they're picking up and like more information. But just by looking at this, um, this website of um, coastalcleanupdata.org, anyone can go just look and see um, some basic information. So this, um, the Chamberlains picked up in October of last year, there were two people that picked up five pounds and they covered um, less than half a mile. Um, so it's just interesting to just kind of see what people are doing, where they're picking up trash. Um, and as you can see, it's not just coastal, it's inland. Um, it's even further north into non-coastal regions. Um, so if you're looking for a really good visual to show people, this one's a good one. And I think this one Yep, so this one was me. Uh, so when we did the Pearl River cleanup and assisted them last um, September, I used the app to um, log all of our data. And we're going to talk about the app here in just a second. Um, but it logged it into Tides. So we kayaked uh, part of the, I think it was the Bowie River. Um, and we picked up 64 pounds of trash in our kayaks. We were hauling tires. We were hauling like refrigerator parts. It was the strangest thing I've ever seen. This one stretch of river was just so compacted with household waste that we, we couldn't take it. We couldn't take all of it, but we were able to tell the Pearl River keepers like, hey, there's, um, you know, there's a whole, there's a whole mountain of trash over here that maybe you guys can go out with like a John boat or some sort of motorboat and go take out. But we were able to remove 64 pounds of trash um, and it's really cool if you have like a group, uh, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, 4-H um, Club, it's kind of cool to like see your name on this map as well. So I just wanted to share that with you guys. All right, so that was the physical data card um, for Ocean Conservancy, but they just recently uh, launched an app. So the Clean Swell app is just basically the uh, electronic version of the data card. It's really cool to use. That's what uh, I just showed you that we used at the Pearl River cleanup um, with our people for the inland cleanup program. Mandy has um, partnered with them to get her um, branded information on there. So if you're anywhere located in the bottom three counties and you open this app, you'll be presented with uh, this very first screenshot where it says the Mississippi Coastal Cleanup Program. So it's pretty cool that you can open it up and then immediately be connected with your local cleanup program and be connected to them um, through that. So I'm hoping to eventually get mine branded um, further north. So in those um, 18 other counties. And so that way when you open it in those counties, you'll be presented with the Inland Cleanup Program uh, logo and branding information. Uh, but very similar to the um, the physical data card with that you, you put in some very basic information, um, date, number of people, what your group is called, the type of location, um, or the type of cleanup, I'm sorry, if it's uh, land-based or water-based. And then basically, uh, once you put in that and you start your collection, you're presented with these little um, widgets of different items. And all you have to do instead of tally on the physical data card, you just tap. So you tap and that's how you collect. And what's really interesting about the app is that it doesn't require data services or Wi-Fi. Um, so for some reason, um, let's say you're kayaking and you turn off your, um, if you turn your phone on airplane mode, you turn off your services, um, you can still use this app. 
and um, it'll still work. It'll still let you collect. And as soon as you come back to service or as soon as you turn your Wi-Fi back on, it'll send all of the data to Ocean, um, Ocean Conservancy and to tides. Um, so that way, if you're in the middle of a cleanup and all of a sudden you hit a dead zone and you have no service, it's completely fine. Your uh, stuff will still get recorded. Um, and it's pretty cool to use to be able to be out in the field and use this option. Um, and then, of course, with any fun app, you do get like these badges. Um, so the more cleanups you do, or if you pick up a certain amount of trash, you get some really cool badges um, that are kind of just fun, fun to get. Um, I'm definitely the type of person that want to get all of them. So <laughs> um, it's just a, a cool little fun added thing to it. Um, as far as using the physical data card versus the app, um, we've had kind of a few issues with the app, just like most technology uh, things, but I personally like the app just because it's, uh, it's waste free. You're not using a piece of paper that's just going to eventually get recycled um, as an aspect. Um, you're not having to keep up with this piece of paper. Um, and if you're kayaking, you're not having to like make sure it's getting wet or anything like that. So there are some trade-offs to it. Um, it's a little glitchy, but at the same time, you don't have this extra piece of paper. Um, now the piece of paper on the other hand, um, I'm sure does help Mandy with the collection of data um, as far as making sure that those numbers are generated a little faster because I think it takes some time to pull that stuff from tides and whatnot. But Mandy, do you have a preference on, like a personal preference on the app versus the data card? I, I think my preference is just due to the fact that I've been using the paper data cards longer and the app is new to me. Um, the paper data cards, to me are a little more detailed. Uh, the app doesn't include every single uh, line of items. Um, it's a little, the app is a little more condensed and a little more uh, broad of the things that you're picking up. And so um, I'm just kind of assuming that whenever it comes to inland versus coastal trash, we're, uh, we're gonna be finding very, not very different, but the inland, we might be finding more of a certain kind of trash compared to what we find down at coast on the coast. And I feel like the app might be a little more catered to what we're finding on coast wise to where inland, um, we might be finding some different things. But I, I honestly, I like them depending on the situation. I really like the paper ones whenever I'm out there with my volunteers and they're actively like turning in data to me because um, then I have it right there. But then I also like the app if I have volunteers who are go-getters and they just want to go off and do their own thing and I don't have to check in on them. Um, the app is really nice to just have that constant continuous uh, engagement and cleanups happening and you're not in the, like, the front lines. Like you don't have to actively be there. Uh, so I, that, that's why I like the app is because it kind of individualizes um, and empowers the volunteers to lead their own cleanup. For sure. Thank you. And I'm glad you said that because now that I think about it, you know, doing just the few inland cleanups that I've done so far, um, it's really interesting to see the different types of trash, the different types of litter that we're finding. You know, I'm so used to, you know, of course, being on the coast and being like, okay, cigarette butts, number one thing we're going to find, <laughs> balloons, fishing gear, and things like that. But the inland cleanups that I've done, it's like a vastly different set. And I'm glad you said that. It kind of reminded me. Um, but we were finding a majority of like, cans, glass bottles, um, construction materials, like very, per, like very specific household items, whereas opposed to, I feel like your cleanups, it's, it's a very wide range of all these very random things because they get washed down through the watershed from up north and it's just this big collection, this big diversity of all these things from all these different places being shoved in one place. So it's really interesting to kind of just see the difference between the two, just on a personal note, but. Okay, so I added this video um, in and it's about how, it's about how to use the Clean Swell app. Um, I'm not gonna make us watch it because it's an eight minute long video um, but I have included it in the Google Drive and it's really easy to find on the um, Ocean Conservancy site. But just to show you, the, um, Hello? they do walk you through like exactly how to use it. Mandy and I basically gave you the rundown. Um, but if you're interested in like learning how to use it, um, how to optimize it and things like that, this video kind of walks you through exactly how to um, go about using it 
in starting a collection and things like that. So it's a good little video. I just don't want to waste eight minutes of your day by watching this whole thing in a presentation, but it is here and it's for you to use. Um, so this data, so we talked about collecting the data. It does go to the Ocean Conservancy. Um, and then again, we use that information for grant opportunities to further litter and trash free research. Um, so we know that people love numbers. Um, it's, it's more palatable to see these, uh, you know, these infographics that Mandy is making from her cleanups. I'm hoping to do something, you know, similar um, or around the same type at some point when I start doing more cleanups. Um, but really, it's interesting to see just how many or how much of stuff that we're getting. Because, um, you know, when you're doing a cleanup, you're kind of in the zone of just picking up trash. You're just, you know, grabbing these things, the day is over, but could you really remember what you're getting? But then to see these numbers afterward, it's a little mind blowing to see that, you know, there's 14,000 cigarette butts that we've picked up off the beach in a year, one year. Um, and then how, how many, you know, how many plastics, how many food wrappers are out of that? What, what are those things in comparison of our daily lives? And then how can that affect our daily lives as far as reducing plastic or making a better choice in the grocery store and things like that? So it's pretty cool to see, you know, an end numerical product at the end of the day of these cleanups. So that's really all, um, all that I have as far as presentation. Um, goes. Does anyone have any questions? Do you think this is, uh, you know, do you think this was something that you're willing to take back to your community and just, you know, start a conversation about something that you learned? Or do you think that this training could uh, be easily adapted to better suit your expertise in a way? I'll definitely be in contact because I know Ole Miss came and done a documentary on how much trash is in our town. Yeah, I recently, I found, um, I didn't realize that they were doing like a trash free education initiative, but Old Miss has some really interesting um, information on their website that I also put in that Google Drive that I'll link you to here in a minute. Um, but some of it was very, very enlightening to look at. Um, and hopefully, you know, even that sparked something to, you know, be able to implement in what you're already teaching or, you know, just in daily conversation. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people about trash free initiatives or even just recycling and they're like, wow, I did, I did not know that Harrison County in Gulfport didn't take glass or, uh, you know, that there's alternatives to this in the grocery store and yada yada that just little things that you can take away um, that are interesting to be able to put on to other people. Yeah, and I'll add to Jesse's question. Um, what other resources um, or assistance would y'all think you would you would need to get something? And maybe not specifically you, but just extension agents in general across all the focus areas would need to kind of um, roll out some litter litter education programs that may or may not involve community cleanups and things like that. Um, just any suggestions on resources because y'all obviously know your job a lot better than we do and you know maybe where the, the gaps are that we can help fill. I see a pretty good uh, response from just a little postcard mail out things um, of just, you know, doing like some type of mass mail out, dealing with, you know, just a little small one sided postcards, whether it's advertising an upcoming program that we have or, but I see a lot of, a lot of response from them as opposed to kind of our old method of, um, you know, just mailing out letters, announcing things and people can put them up on their refrigerator or, you know, whether it be advertising what is available for recycling in that particular area or so that they can remind themselves to sort through whatever it is or just anything like that or an upcoming, you know, program or a day of cleanup, whatever 
creek or river or whatever it may be. Yeah, so I'm, I'm guessing from that, like it, it would be beneficial if, you know, when we work together on these, on these programs and then maybe we could design little post postcards for mail outs and that that kind of stuff like on our end on our our team right exactly either that you know that or just whether we um do something just announcing what is available in your area i know that you know it's kind of which we do it on the through the mail order or through the mail services thing where we get on there and like design a little postcard thing through the internet extension internet and you know we send it out to our clientele which we have you know and we can personalize it kind of to our area or to our mailing list whether it be what's available in our area just to let them know uh whether you know not necessarily for advertising a particular work day or in particular but just letting getting the word out what's available in our area or you know what type of recycling is available to not include get glass if you live in Harrison County, you know, or not put certain stuff or do separate out the paper products versus the plastic and all that in your versus in your garbage versus your recycling bin. Gotcha. Um this is this is me just not knowing the MSU system from the agent side too much, but whenever you do those type of mail outs, you order them through campus to is that covered by 18 funds? Like that's covered by the extension budget? Because I mean, on, on, it is. Correct. Okay, so like we could design, we could design something, um, at, give it to y'all, upload it through that system, and then it could be distributed that way. Correct. Okay. Yeah, I don't know what it is. I think it's like if you get if you get grants, they expect you to pay for everything by yourself. And it's just like okay, you can't use the state funds anymore. Um, so yeah, I mean. We don't get to tap into that at right. all. And we have a big, we we do a multi-county newsletter. Me or Lamar, Forrest, Stone. I mean, it's a bunch of us. Harrison, um, Pearl River. There's We have, I don't know, probably close to 20,000 contacts on that that we mail that, uh, mail or slash email that newsletter to every month. Um, and, you know, we'd love to have something even included in that if, you know, y'all are interested in getting something out, writing an article, you know, a little short article about, you know, what's co events coming up or something. We'd love to have y'all participate in that as well. Yeah, I had thought about, you know, in particular, my program being expanded to so many counties. I can't be in one place, you know, all the time. I thought about making um, like a, a newsletter, almost like an um, you call the like the email newsletters that go out that could just be like forwarded on to people that has you know just local information or highlights about particular counties um right. information and things like that so i think that might be um something good on top of doing those um mail outs and things like that that might just be e just as easy to just forward on to like a, a mailing list or a group of people and things like that as well yeah and um you know our our, I guess the overall major intent of this program is to be able to help individual communities or counties or whoever it is be able to kind of do this stuff themselves eventually, kind of build the capacity, um, like support on the front end. And then hopefully by the time the grant ends three years from now, there's enough momentum that, you know, they collectively, the communities want to keep doing this stuff. Um, so I, I like, I would much prefer that the communication go out through the community members that we're kind of operating behind the scenes um to like get you the info that you need support all that stuff to get it out um i think it'll be received a lot better than that because they know y'all they don't know us um and all that so that's i guess just keep that in mind whenever you're thinking about potential leverage points and opportunities like we're perfectly fine just being the in the in the dark in the corner and just trying to help help everybody get stuff going as best they can. Have y'all ever thought about doing a social media campaign? Because I know a lot of us have got county Facebook pages, and like Ross said, the postcards get more attention than letters or flyers. But some of us that are 
got old school people, they still read the newspaper. So social media and the newspaper are also good ways to, to contact individuals. Um, so yeah, so Mandy and I try really hard to be uh, very present on social media. Um, let me give you this. So if you're interested in our social media accounts, these are these are it. Uh, so for our two programs, the best one I would say to go to is nolittermovement.com. So like I said, that has way more resources that are kind of catered um, by state and they're also catered by program. Um, so we're hoping to, you know, anytime that we necessarily have an event, uh, we're trying to be really good about like creating social media events so people can, you know, kind of virally share those and get it spread through basically like electronic word of mouth, I guess is the way <laughs> the way it works now. Um, and just making sure that we're getting it out as many ways as possible. Um, we also, um, I would say, try our best in getting into a lot of print um, places which end up electronically. I know we've done quite a few articles for different um, newsletters or magazines and things like that just to get the word out about these places. Um, but definitely for sure trying to um, just spread the word more and just getting it out there as far as uh, what we do, where, where we are, where we'll go, and um, you know what we're here for. So going back to what Eric was just saying too is that you know we are here to help you guys. You know we are a tool um, to be used, um, me especially inland, if, if you have a question in particular about your county, if you're just curious as, um, you know, how does composting work? How does, here's my recycling uh, website for our county, but I don't quite understand what it means here. What does this mean? That's pretty much the purpose of my position almost. So, I mean, you can shoot me an email. I don't mind emails like that. Or if you're just looking for what's my, what's my local resource for cleanups or events or what's near me that I could use. I'm definitely here to help you make those connections as well. Um, just like I would hope that you would help me connect to those local places that I might not know about, so. Yeah, I think that's a key point too, is like even, because we all know that y'all are extremely busy. So um, even if you think like, man, this would be a good thing to partner up with this organization. Maybe it's a key uh, Mississippi Beautiful chapter, or maybe it's a, I uh, don't know. We've been working with a, a women's club through Dawn. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a group like that. It's like, man, they could really take this and run with it. And they've got the time, um, resources that can help with that. And, you know, help put us in contact with them and we'll uh, get them going. Any, I mean, our main goal is to get, reduce the litter issue, however we need to do that. So, um, yeah, just let us know how we can help. Yeah. So, here to help. <laughs> Definitely follow us on social media to, you know, stay up to date. The, the easiest one to remember is nolittermovement.com. Um, we purposely created that to be easy to find. Um, so you're not trying to search Instagram for all of our different handles um, and things like that. Um, so I will send you guys this PowerPoint because I know it was just lengthy. Um, so I can send it to you guys um, if you're looking to scroll back through and find something in particular. Um, or if you want to watch that eight minute video on clean swell. Um, I also do have that Google Drive that I just linked. So let me show you that real quick. So this is what it looks like when you get into it. Um, so this drive in particular is just basically a dump of all the, all the things that just comes across my desk basically. Um, so I just have this wealth of knowledge that is is good for me to know, but what does that really do if I'm not using it? So why not put it all in one spot for other people that it's more applicable to, to use? Um, so I plan to um, update this as I go. So it's got lots of cleanup resources. If you're interested in using the Clean Swell app, um, here's that video. There's also a poster. Um, this is the actual physical data card you can print or we're more than happy to send you some if you want the hard cardstock copy. Lots of K through 12 resources. Um, I've got lots of cool videos on cafeteria waste, composting, 
there's different activities um, that are pretty quick and easy to um, just add into curriculum. Um, and this is just really the tip of it. I haven't had a chance to upload everything I have on my computer quite yet, um, but it's gonna be really robust at some point. I've also got, oh, well, I need to add a, quite a few. Uh, journal articles, if you're looking to um, actually read the scientific article that backs the data or backs the information to these activities, I'm going to have those in there. And they're going to be split up by, uh, you know, the different categories. Like if you're looking for specific information on plastics, there's going to be a folder for that. If you're looking for specific information on um making better cho choices in the grocery store or shopping and things like that there can be a, a section for that as well so i put that link um in the chat um that link is specific for you guys um i don't think you're able to share it past that but you can definitely like download the resources and share those as well um so hopefully that's helpful for you guys to use um i just thought it's something we should probably should add a like um funding sources folder in there because we just had this happen there was we get emails with a bunch of grant opportunities like y'all probably do too and some of them we're not eligible for but schools are or, or organi other organizations are and we just we connected and helped um a element or a no, middle school i guess in um jackson county with one of theirs and they just got like water bottle refillers for their school funded through the the grants um and they're working on a cafeteria waste thing too so yeah there's i think that could be a, useful to like math blast some of that stuff sometimes yeah i can add that in there for sure i've got i've got a ton of things to add into there that was just what i could uh upload as fast as i could yesterday before this <laughs> this presentation um but i'm hoping that those resources come in handy you know um and just to drive home that point that that's what we're here for i I'm here to take that information and put it to good use where it needs to go. Um, and that's that's all I have. If Eric or Mandy have anything they want to jump in on, uh, definitely appreciate you guys uh, registering and coming and listening to us talk trash for two hours. <laughs> and hopefully it was helpful and hopefully that you um, find something that you want to take back to your community and let us know if we can uh, do a better job of doing that. So the Google Drive, and you click on it, it says that you have to request access, and I did that. So will you send me something, or is it going to send me an email? Uh, so I just got that email. I'll go in. Um, so if you click on the link and you request access, I'll go in and grant you that access. Okay. Um, so there you go. I just sent it back to you. Um, right. so if you click it, it'll email me directly, just letting me know that you're, uh, you're knocking on the door to be let in and I'll make sure that it grants you access to it. Thank you. And I'll, um, instead of sending this PowerPoint to you, since it's, it's a pretty big file, I'll just upload it into the Google Drive and you can have access to it that way. Anything else that anybody wanted to uh, mention while we're on the line before we hop off? Alrighty, well, thank you guys. Definitely appreciate it. Like I said, um, if you're interested in suggesting a cleanup, if you want more information about you know anything in your particular county that I might have connections to, or if you wanna share something, you can definitely email me um it's jesse.james at msstate.edu um and then you can find all sorts of resources over at no litter movement.com as well so thanks guys appreciate it have a good day